those who are here, thank you for coming. For those that weren't able to make it, uh, we've just started recording. Uh, and so we hope that you do enjoy later uh, this presentation by Florian Lefebvre. And the talk that he's giving today is called The Development of Esports Curricula in British Universities and Their Implications for Higher Education in Vietnam. So without, uh, well, I guess I should introduce myself very quickly. I'm Patrick Williams. I'm the chair of this uh, APRU Games and Esports uh, Research Working Group. With me today is also Upe Zhao, who is the co-chair, uh, as well as a variety of participants in and out of the network. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, Florian, I will go ahead and turn uh, it over to you and thank you in advance for this presentation. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Patrick, for the introduction. Um, so I will start just a little thing I want to say. I'm sorry, I forgot to change the name because I, I presented in, in French language two days ago um, and I was uh, quite uh, sick since uh, 10 days. <laughs> Um, so the, the presentation I will um, introduce you today is uh, about the development of esports curriculum in British University, and the goal is to see how we can try to find some implication for university in Vietnam that want to uh, get involved in um, in esports. Um, oh, uh, why well, I don't see. I don't see my uh, screen anymore. No, it just disappeared. No. We'll, we'll wait a minute. No problem. Uh, I will uh, share again. Okay. Ah, uh, because I wanted to mask it, but uh, cannot mask. Yeah. Yeah. Now it's got okay. Okay. Um, and uh, I'm also associate researcher with University of Rouen and uh, University of uh, Paris Sacré. Um, so to begin with, uh, I will start with some uh, context. So if we look at uh, when uh, the esports curriculum have started to develop and uh, get a bit more massive, it's uh, quite connected with uh, the, um, the moment in esports where there was more non-endelic uh, stakeholder. Like uh, if we see, uh, for instance, uh, in 2014, uh, when uh, Twitch was uh, acquired by um, Amazon. And uh, after this, some uh, sport organization like Besiktas, one year later, they start to enter in esports. And uh, uh, if you look at the, in the US, for instance, um, Phillips Morris, um, I think Harris Morris University, I don't remember exactly, they started uh, in this uh, uh, period. And uh, this is a period where we start to see more elite sport athletes who get uh, committed into e-sport like Mesut Ozil appears, the former uh, Arsenal and Real Madrid uh, football player, more traditional media like l'équipe in France or ESPN, more non-endemic sponsors, some legal actors. There is also a growing institution institutionalization of e-sports practice and uh, resulting from this, um, Oh, I cannot see my, ah, okay. Uh, resulting for this, um, there is quite a new, some need about the e-sport career uh, structuration that were recently uh, highlighted and also about the e-sport workforce requirement. Um, okay. Uh, and so when, as I was saying, we see uh, quite a switch in 2016 where the, um, there was a bit more uh, universities that started to commit uh, in esports around the world, because before that was just a few of them, like in 2004 and 2007. And uh, until, uh, I would say until COVID, it continued to grow quite, uh, quite fast. Uh, another aspect which is quite important is the growth of esports club inside the uh, university. So 2019, there was um, quite a few, 1,060 sports club inside nearly 600 university. But one issue with that was that there was not uh, really a framework that can uh, uh, align with the expectation of uh, highly qualified labor force for, uh, for esports. So that brings me to the research question 
gap and question. So in the literature, we see that uh, um, esports curriculum development have been uh, uh, already investigated in North America um, and in some uh, Asian countries like China, Japan, uh, Philippines, Thailand, and South Korea. Um, but we don't see any um, uh, study focusing on uh, Vietnam. And uh, also in Europe, we don't see a study like in France or in the UK. And uh, why I choose the case of uh, UK and Vietnam? Uh, UK, because uh, in Europe, it's one of the countries with the highest number of esports curriculum at um, the university, like degree level, for instance. Uh, so it was uh, for me more um, logical that to choose uh, France. And also another reason is that for me, it was more easy uh, to collect data on the UK rather than uh, on the US, for instance, where, where there are even more uh, esports curriculum at uh, university. Um, and reason for Vietnam is uh, because I'm living here since uh, se seven months. And uh, it's, um, um, I mean, there is less, there is no curriculum yet, so we can compare two different situations. So, okay, so the research question uh, was how Vietnamese university could learn from the experience of British ones that are already committed in sport to create the condition for the development of their own dedicated sports curriculum. So some uh, quick literature review uh, about the two countries. So when we look at the British sports curriculum, we saw that it started um, six years ago with uh, Staffordshire University when they started the first um, quite generic uh, esports degree. And then from there, there's quite an important rise with uh, more and more uh, university, high school, private institutes that started to develop their curriculum. Uh, and there is also the specificity in the UK, then there is a lot of um, level free esports BTEC that you can find in high school. So some students um, can decide to continue uh, at the university after this BTEC or try to work in esports after, after this. And uh, two years ago, when I started this uh, research, so I saw the situation was uh, about uh, 14 universities in the UK, with six of them uh, delivering uh, a curriculum. Um, and uh, also, there was a quite um, growing esports governance in the UK with the report uh, of Digital Culture Media and Sports Committee, who print out different uh, stakes for the development of esports in the UK but also some national associations who try to foster the professionalization of his sports stakeholder, but also the grassroots competition. Whereas in Vietnam, we saw that the implementation of uh, esports at the university, esports courses, is more uh, old, we can say, uh, because uh, Ho Chi Minh City um, University of Sport, they were the first to do this, uh, in uh, 2010 with esports courses in marketing and event management. And from there, we can see that the next year, there was a quite an important development about uh, esports um, student championship in Vietnam with the university sports uh, championship. That is still now, um, uh, I check it uh, until 2022, it was still active. Um, so now it's, many more universities that participate to this uh, event. For instance, the last occupation was on PUBG, I think PUBG, um, PUBG or PUBG Mobile. Um, and uh, two years ago, there was uh, um, Esports Federation of uh, Vietnam called Vireza. They wrote their white paper when they, they told that in, in the future, they would like, like in a few years, uh, to have more than more than 10,000 workers in the Vietnamese sports industry. And they highlight the National Economic University Sports Club, uh, NECNEU, as a benchmark to follow for other universities because they organize a lot of uh, uh, career orientation day, uh, esports student event, for instance. Um, so it's quite a very active esports club. And um, that is interesting to see this. 
And the situation two years ago is more about a uh, 50 university sports club, but um, not um, a side university of sport of Ho Chi Minh. Uh, no really sports courses that we find. Whereas in Thailand, there is already four universities that uh, deliver some esports courses. So now the research framework from this study. So we choose to focus on the three fourth stage of the integrative approach to curriculum development of Han and Lo in 2015. So we have a fourth stage is we try to look about to look uh, at the internal and external environment of educational institutions. So what is the environment, for instance, of uh, Vietnamese universities that would like maybe the future to create some curriculum? Then the second stage, a specific competency to develop in students uh, to help them to find a work in the area of the curriculum. So in in this first, in the framework, they highlight personal, professional, and institutional competencies. And then the third stage is actually how you can try to develop the curriculum and which recommendation you can add. So they also highlight that it's important to take into consideration some complementary factor like the society. So for instance, the view of e-sport from the society, the development of the industry you try to prepare the student for, but also the view of government and educational institution about, about this. And why we don't focus on stage four and stage five is because in the case of Vietnam, since there is not really a sports curriculum yet, we cannot really look uh, how the ped pedagogical strategy were uh, are implemented. And we cannot really do this follow-up implementation of the curriculum and evaluation. Um, so the goal uh, for this would be to provide some practical implication for the case of Vietnam. Um, and also, I forgot to say this, but why we do this is also because um, Vietnam National University, they are interested to maybe in the future open an esports curriculum. So it's also one of the reasons. Uh, so now about the methodology, we chose to do a qualitative objective study. Uh, we have three specific targets that we wanted to do some interviews. So British esports lecturer or teacher, uh, British esports worker, and Vietnamese esports worker. Uh, so why those uh, targets? The idea was to better understand uh, the rationale behind the development of esports curriculum in the UK, uh, how this is uh, esports is perceived, uh, there is a little mistake, uh, how it's perceived both in the UK and um, in, uh, in Vietnam. And uh, target three, um, more understand the, the national environment, so better understanding the rationale behind the possible create creation of sports curriculum in Vietnam. And again, the goal would be to design some strategic recommendation. So with this, we, we proceed to the data collection from January to April uh, this year and contacted uh, 82 people. Um, and we reach uh, so about uh, one quarter of uh, people uh, we contact accepted to participate to the study. And for target one and three, we are quite happy with the number of people we, we get. Uh, especially because uh, um, we got we got something like maybe half of the universities that have an esports curriculum in the UK are uh, represented in the study. Uh, but for second target, um, that is one of the limits. We will be happy to have maybe one or two more um, interview. And for third target, we really try to have uh, people um, committed in. Uh, different um, type of esport organization like game publisher, professional esports team, um, esports agency, for instance, uh, also streaming platform. Uh, then how we analyze those uh, data, we did a thematic cat categorical analysis thanks to QSL and Vivo 10. 
uh, to have both the internal and external environments uh, in which uh, esports curriculum creation can be embedded. And uh, we got a total of uh, 14 fourth level code and 322 in uh, total. And uh, most of the code um, in the fourth stages of uh, integrative approach curriculum development uh, related to the environmental scanning with um, uh, seven of them in external environment and three in internal uh, environment. So I will start to show the result now. Uh, to begin with the results, the first uh, aspect of environmental scanning was uh, the external environment with the case of British Esports curriculum. So the data we collect help us to, let's say, confirm the literature review we did uh, about um, British Esports curriculum development. And people uh, quite highlighted that for interview, we highlighted that for them, it's still considered as maybe the beginning and they think maybe five or 10 more university will uh, open a uh, university degree in the future. And again, one of the biggest specificity of the UK is the fact that they can do this uh, curriculum after a BTEC in uh, high school. Um, then the, the interview, um, one aspect they highlight about the role of the university uh, was um, to take into consideration the development of specific program rather than generic program, because at the beginning in the UK, there was more um, esports curriculum like called uh, esports BA, um, like esports BA, something like this. Uh, quite generic, um, and they highlight also the need to develop more employable and transferable skills, uh, because most of them said it's not because you do an esports degree that you will work in esports, so you need those transferable skills. Um, then about the main risk and problematic about uh, esports uh, related to the British esports curriculum, we found six main um, issues. Um, so about the question on unemployment, uh, most of the interviewee again say that you can uh, fix, let's say, fix this issue with uh, developing some employable skills or do some networking. Uh, but when, but it's quite important that it's a quote uh, that I put, like one um, one uh, esports caster that is uh, for more students. He highlights that in his promotion, like from 21 students, three got a job in esports. So when we look at the concrete uh, outcome, there is um, um, not really a correlation between what uh, lecturers are saying, like, oh, people will got a job and the reality. So th this was quite important, I think. Um, then, um, Diversity was very important in the case of the UK. Um, staffing as well, how you find the staff that can uh, be um, have a background in esports, for instance, that many universities in the UK require for the lecturer. Um, and biggest issue, one of the biggest issue was also the fact that some interviewees said that um university open maybe too fast some uh, uh, esports courses and it can be perceived as a money grabber and last uh, issue um the issue about too generic inappropriate uh, content that doesn't really help the, the student and also the issue it was a bit uh, con controversial i would say but some uh, university uh, during the interview where uh, telling oh this university is uh, doing some plagiarism of my content and then I interview the other one and they say the opposite <laughs> so it was a bit um, not easy to analyze I would say um, then last aspect about this uh, I can do more fast for this but um, they said that main idea they think it will continue to develop but there is a need to reshape the program and make them more specific, I would say. 
Uh, second part of the environmental scanning was more the perception of e-sport from the society. So there was some question about how to enter e-sport. And one result was that um, the free quarter of interviewee thought that having a, a degree, whether it's in, I don't know, communication, marketing, business, um, whatever, they think it's like a tool that can help to enter e-sport. Um, but it was interesting to see that also some of them, like uh, seven interviewees said that at the end, you don't really need a degree because many people didn't start with a degree and you will more need some portfolio background experience and network. Um, then um, some about the question, like should university provide some esports curriculum? Um, people were quite, um, positive about this, but uh, some of them um, also said that it's maybe a bit too soon or we don't really need um, esports course, but more additional course for the student in uh, existing curriculum, for instance. And some people uh, didn't really give a clear answer. So that's the reason like only 16 people uh, really say yes or no for this. Uh, then when we try to look at, at which uh, topic they find quite legitimate to study, uh, main result about this would be that um, if we look at all the topics in blue, it's more, let's say, the core, uh, what is uh, related to the core um, job and industry in esports. So basically, how you organize an event, how you do the broadcast, the streaming, the production, um, how you promote it, the marketing, the communication, and how you try to make money, so business uh, management. And when it comes to um, more specific uh, ID, um, it was really not a lot of interviewees that I like this. So maybe it's still interesting, but it can be really, uh, I don't know, one uh, curriculum in one country uh, can be enough for this type of topic, like nutrition and coaching that are still really relevant in e-sport nonetheless. Um, then when we look at the internal environment of uh, Vietnam, so um, the interview with the Vietnamese uh, interviewee, they were quite, um, there was quite a consensus that for them, they think that there is a higher demand of um, qualified labor force in uh, Vietnam in the in the next coming year, um, and they also highlight some uh, aspects that they think some game publisher like Garena with League of Legends and Arena of Valor, uh, but also VTC, VNG, uh, really help to uh, promote the sports in Vietnam to make this industry a bit more uh, bigger and to help stakeholders to have some professionalization because even before two years, some professional players were not really paid. And more recently also the fact of uh, um, esports being a medal uh, event at the SEA Games, uh, it start to have some public uh, recognition. Um, but at the same time, when I asked them about the main concern about esports development in Vietnam, um, most of them said that there is quite an issue about how esports is recognized as a true career, something that can be relevant. So, for instance, the older generation of uh, the parents, so it was one of the um, esports managers who says this, like they don't understand why uh, their son is doing uh, this and how he can make money from this. Also, one biggest issue that maybe is less of a surprise is the issue related to the financial development of and the sustainability of the professional esports team and esports stakeholders in uh, Vietnam that we find also in Europe or the US. And uh, some of them uh, highlight the lack of qualified uh, uh, labor force. That, for instance, some of them, uh, they say some students uh, come to recruitment and they don't know what it is mobile, for instance. I got this uh, this quote. Um, and the last aspect of internal environment, um, about uh, one of the last aspects, sorry, about the esports curriculum stages, it helped 
to confirm the pioneer situation of Ho Chi Minh City University of Sport. Uh, but in reality, when we look even in their website and we found their, their schedule, their time schedule, uh, esports doesn't appear in the schedule. So we, we guess, um, we are not sure, we will try to investigate more, but we, we think maybe uh, it's just part of sports management. We will try to investigate this more. Um, and we also find that one professional team, uh, Team Flash, began to organize some esports curriculum uh, in Singapore, uh, esports com, sorry, in Singapore. Um, then uh, some idea, there was less um, data about this, but uh, many interviewees think esports club can be um, the most relevant idea to start with. Um, then about the risk and issue, they also highlight um, issue um, about um, unemployment, uh, issue about uh, staffing, um, but uh, it was um, maybe a bit surprising. Um, gender equality was really less um, important in the eyes of uh, the interviewee in Vietnam because they think uh, it's maybe more accepted and and we find more women, for instance, uh, in the esports club. Uh, I saw this uh, also in the esports club. So a lot more. Uh, women at some in some club in France, for instance. Um, and then uh, about the second stages, so I have two slides about the second stages. Uh, most aspects that we can, uh, most important things that we can say is that um, when I try to classify the main skills, uh, let's say to enter in esports and which skill um, university could try to help the student to get, it was more about personal skills like oral written communication, networking, uh, having a true passion for esports in order to maybe, but try to avoid the burnout, uh, critical thinking, desire to learn some problem solving and teamwork. Uh, whereas for the art skill needed in esports, it was more about the professional skill, like how you do the marketing, the communication, uh, of an esports organization, how you organize some event, how um, you develop some uh, um, creative esports skill, but also the foreign language. Like I have uh, one esports manager who explains that for the player or for the manager, uh, if you can speak uh, English, it gives you some opportunity at the global stage. But if you speak also the language of uh, uh, neighboring country and main Asian country can also be valuable. And uh, they also highlight the need for um, prof professional skills that can be uh, trans trans transferable to other industry. Uh, last aspect, maybe the most important slide in the result was uh, the question about what can be the concrete um, uh, recommendation for stage three uh, for Vietnam. And I try to classify the recommendation in um, uh, four uh, main uh, category with the node uh, that was uh, most relevant. So first category was um, how to start, what you should do maybe before a curriculum and um, civil interviewee I like the need to maybe start with some individual or minor module in existing curriculum. Um, then about the format for a curriculum, it was again about uh, try to make it specific. Uh, don't do maybe the same mistake that it was in the beginning in the UK. So now in the UK, they already uh, began to do some more specific curriculum, but at the beginning, it was a bit more generic and also try to um, help the student to get some transferable skill and in which condition it was very important for the interviewee that they need to, to, to have some partner from industry, like giving some guest lecture or having partner for in internship and also the staffing uh, working with the government and 
even if it was only two interview really, I found this quote really relevant about focusing on quality versus quantity. Like for instance, in some British universities, there is some cohort of 100 students every year. And I think maybe it's a bit much like compared to how many will get a job in esports. Um, so it's this process about um, um, going from stage one to stage two to stage three that help to have a better idea of the process to develop curriculum development. Um, so I will now go to the discussion. Um, so of course this study is not finished and I have still some uh, literature review to continue, but some uh, theoretical uh, implication. So at first, uh, geographical one, because it's one of the first study that compared to country and I guess the first, first study in Vietnam and one of the first in the UK, if not the first. Uh, then it's one of the first study who apply the free first stage of integrative approach to curriculum development to esports, um, because there was other um, framework uh, for esports curriculum for curriculum development in esports before, um, and uh, it's also helped to have a better understanding of the rationale behind how you will how you can create an esports curriculum in NY. Uh, whereas the uh, former study was more to highlight uh, how many sports curriculums there are in the world and how they are developed. And about practical implications, so we would um, do three main implications. Uh, maybe the first would be to going slow in the case of Vietnam, uh, because Vietnam has quite an important um, um, esports club. Um, number of esports clubs in the university. And maybe it can be interesting to analyze more, uh, maybe with Vileza or with the government, um, the link uh, between uh, how many of students in those esports club, club want to work in esports. And it can uh, give maybe a better highlight of the workforce need. I don't know, something like this. Uh, then. Um, before to launch some curriculum to consolidate the development of this sports club, which is very important, I think. And so aspect, when you reach a point that, okay, you really want to do an esports curriculum, um, how you can do this? Uh, so two possible paths, uh, try first to make specific modules in existing curriculum that can make sense and doesn't require maybe the, the student to pay a lot of money for this sports uh, degree. Um, so it's first idea and second idea, try to develop specific curriculum that maybe can be supported by government or by sports stakeholders. So for instance, for sports, um, sports business management. So Vietnam National University, they have a special curriculum just for elite sport athletes for them to learn uh, about business management. So, and it's the only one in Vietnam to do this. Uh, then it can be tried to focus on some core esports subject to help the student to have more chance to get a job. Uh, support the education with, um, uh, try to help uh, Vietnamese people uh, to become esports teacher, esports researcher, because there is not a lot in Vietnam. Um, try to integrate some local train like the development of uh, uh, esports on mobile that is quite important in uh, in Vietnam right now and maybe maybe try to control I don't know if it should be by the government but maybe some public authority can control the development of esports curriculum to um, avoid um, having to I, um, offer of young student graduate um, yeah to be too big offer compared to the existing uh, demand because when you look at uh, esports job uh, online you you don't find that much uh, every month um, in, in Vietnam especially uh, so conclusion uh, how Vietnamese university could learn from the experience of British ones that are really committed in esports to create conditions for the development of the own dedicated esports curriculum. 
Uh, so two main points. The first one, maybe try to take care of both some external environments. So here we analyze the case of the UK and your own uh, case, so Vietnam case, to know more how you can develop it and try to be more specific. And then again, it's the idea to take their time, support the development of eSports club, uh, get involved with eSports stakeholder, and also focus on quality of students rather than many, many students in one court, but then uh, they have to work in another area of eSports for most of them. Um, and some uh, so some limitation of this research, uh, I, I think stage two can be really enhanced and we have really more information about stage one and a lot of data for the question about stage three. Uh, then maybe we could it could have been interesting to highlight stage four and five in the case of um, UK. Maybe we could have asked some question about this, so it might be uh, maybe a mistake that we did. Um, and um, also, we could have more investigated the case of Ocean City University of Sport and the number of interviews in the second target. And some perspective, it can be interesting to investigate other countries like in France. Uh, in France, so there was a presentation of Nicola Besson two days ago, and he highlights, he highlights there is more than 35, maybe, esports um, module or curriculum or organizations that give uh, um, esports curriculum, esports courses in France, for instance. Uh, China and US also can be quite important uh, market to investigate, but also maybe the perception about Vietnamese authorities regarding the development of esports curriculum. So thank you very much for your attention and uh, don't hesitate if you have some uh, some question. Okay, thanks Florian. That was quite interesting actually. Um, I appreciate you taking the time to share it with us. Um, I have a couple of questions, but let me see if anyone else in the room wants to ask first. If you don't have a microphone or for whatever reason not able to ask verbally, uh, feel free to type a question into the chat and I will relay it or Florian will be able to see it there. Anyone want to start? I try to see if there is. A... There's, there no, some... there's no no questions yet, but I'll keep an eye on ah, it. Okay. Yeah. I'm wondering about, um, okay, I'll start with actually a, a provocative question, which is, okay. to what extent do you think Vietnamese universities need a curriculum similar to what Britain needs? And so I'm thinking about a couple of different things here. One is I'm just wondering about regional differences or cultural differences. So for example, uh, well, as well as relationships. So I think about uh, colonial, the history of colonialism in Southeast Asia. I wondered the extent to which uh, Southeast Asian uh, countries or universities should continue to rely on the West for information about what they ought to be doing, but then just differently like cultural differences. Um, you know, in Southeast Asia, you're gonna have a, a higher concern with Asian values, for example, if, as a stereotype. And those things may shape the esports ecosystem very differently. So I'm just wondering whether, you're, whether the data that you collected gave you any any ideas about how much they should be relying on the West? Uh, so the, thank you for for your question, uh, Patrick. Uh, I think it's uh, it's um, something that can be quite important indeed. Um, I would guess that um, in the case of what this was done in the West, um, the main idea would be maybe to not do the, the same mistake like like i think in the in the west like when you try uh to look for a job in this sport like in the uk or in france the market is quite saturated i think 
So even myself, I try to get a job in sports and it's like every time there is 200 people on uh, for one job offer, so you don't get a, an answer. It's very, very complicated, like, like, like in traditional sport, I would say, I believe. Um, and since uh, the more university and private or public um, um, start some curriculum, the more graduated student you will you will add, and at this point it's just um, um, how I can say this. It just increasing the um, competition to get a job. I would say, um, and then there is many other issues um, in the UK, like as I said, the number of students in some court. Um, for me, doesn't doesn't make sense because when you look at the job, you don't you don't find that many offer every month. Um, and what you said about cultural difference, I think is very important um, because, for instance, um, as I was saying, the development of mobile esports is quite a thing here. Like the I went to a um, e-sport event organized by uh, uh, National Economic University student on uh, Arena of Valor, um, like in two months ago. And um, I was actually surprised of the gender uh, diversity representation. Like um, when I go, because, I, because uh, um traditionally when you look at maybe a MOBA you will find quite a very small percentage of women and mm -hmm. in the esports club there are quite more mm -hmm. uh i don't know if it's 50 50 i don't think so but it's quite uh impressive um about this um I don't know if I really asked the question, but I, no, I would yeah. say to focus more it... on the the um, cultural difference is really important. Um, but uh, I didn't have that many quotes, I would say, uh, about this. Um, no, I think the insight you gave was pretty good. I, I found your final comment there on the gender diversity quite revealing. And I think it's something that I have seen myself, which is a lot of people assume that esports is just about being a professional player. And they don't necessarily think about all the other uh, roles and identities that need to be part of that ecosystem for it to uh, survive. Uh, and so it's not just gender diversity, but a diversity of roles and interests within esports. It's not only about playing the game uh, that's important. Tom asks a question. I know he has a, doesn't have a microphone, but um, he asked a question that, that builds off what you were just saying, which is that with so few graduates, as you mentioned, getting jobs, do you think that having an esports minor, right, uh, or something smaller than a maybe a four-year degree program would that be the sweet spot is that something that maybe universities should be targeting targeting uh, either in the shorter long term uh so i will i think uh i will try to speak for the case of vietnam because maybe it can be different in other countries uh, of course but in vietnam i think that is actually a good idea uh to do just some ice pop minor because um when i did um like one of the interview we uh, interview wa was with uh, the president and vice president of um um an esports club like uh, in uh, hanoi from uh, university and especially this interview the the students they explained that um they, they get some experience in esports thanks to the uh, university sports club um so the e-sport minor can be um complementary i would say to the development of esports club and maybe doing something um i, I try to find the word in english um uh, uh, cross um 
like transdiscipli transdisciplinary uh, minor maybe mm. so something like um, um, you can do this e-sport minor but let's say you are I don't know you are a student in a law degree and um, you are you have a, I don't know a friend in a marketing degree and two those two students can follow the same e-sport minor for instance I don't know if my answer makes sense but if you look at uh, big university like Vietnam National University or University of Economics, this type of university, in the same big university, you have different topics to study. So maybe it can make sense. Um, so yeah, I, I would say e-sport minor is quite uh, important. And maybe before, if there is other question, I would like to uh, go back to what you were saying, Patrick, about the fact that uh, there is uh, not only uh, e-sport is not only becoming a player. This was also something that was highlighted in, uh, I think, something like three or four interviews with Vietnamese e-sports workers, especially with manager and head of e-sports of uh, professional e-sports team. Um, they say that when they get some new people in a recruitment uh, process and interview, uh, most of them say, oh, I play e-sport, I watch e-sport, so I think uh, I can do the job, I can be I can be a player or I, or I can be a manager, but when then the people um, explain, um, uh, when the head of e-sport, sorry, uh, told them, okay, but for this you need to play uh, eight or ten hours per day, something like this, and you need to really uh, do this for a very long time that it make it may make you burn out at some point um like it's a risk um then they try to see a switch like in one or three years many of the some employee of them start to uh, reconsider working in sports and some leave because of this so it was quite interesting so um I hope I answer this question. Yes, thanks very much. I think Upe has a question next. Uh, yeah, hi, Flora. Thank you for your presentation. That's very ins inspiration. And uh, I also have a small question follow up. Um, do you think that it, it is more practical uh, or well recognized for those students if the university or the higher education can be closely with? Uh, cooperate with the industry, in particular those industry who are leading one. Uh, I ask because in China we have also a lot of um, eSport major. Uh, however, I don't think that that industrial stakeholders are really um, recognized or credit those major. So uh, I'm still confused about whether it is the right direction to lead those students to, to study e-sport. Uh, however, on the other side, I'm thinking, because I would like to inspire, uh, learn from your data to, to say, um, for example, I'm thinking for students who major in e-sport, not just uh, teach them how to play e-sport because those comes from talent. So what I'm thinking is, uh, we should uh, get offer them the comprehensive uh, the, the program to uh, leading them to think, to, to design the e-sport because e-sport is not just about uh, sport, but also is about smart media. So probably, probably that is my, yeah, confusing. Thank you. Uh, th thank you, Yubei, for, for your, your question. Um, so I, I, I'm not sure if I really um, un understand, but is it about um, like uh, the, how we can involve the partners? Yeah, or... do you think that the, the university or the high school should closely relate to uh, the, the industry to design the program, to work together ah, to okay, lead this? Okay. Uh, I think I understand better. Um, uh, I think that's uh, quite um, maybe a um, difficult point uh, because it makes me think about the situation in France where some uh, private private school 
uh, like for instance, um, for instance, a gaming uh, campus in Lyon, uh, in France, they have some partnership or they had in the past. I don't know if it's still the case, but some partnership with uh, esports team like Team Vitality. Uh, but it means that if you are a student, uh, but you you are not in this school, you will not get the chance to work with Team Vit Vitality because the students that graduate from gaming campus will have this chance before you. Um, so it can create the, the maybe the negative aspect is that it can create even more an elite, an elitist system. Like if you can pay the price for your curriculum, you have more chance to get those maybe internship with the partner of uh, the school or the university. Uh, so maybe it can be the, the negative aspect. So I would say to answer your, your question, maybe to, um, uh, I, I try to find the word in English. Um, oh, I, I don't know the word in English. Um, like try to maybe present some idea of the curriculum or um, um, the program to some esports company. Uh, try to speak with them to see if that makes sense. But at the end, maybe the university should uh, have the final point on how to develop their, their curriculum. Um, because if it's too much um, developed by, by one or two companies, um, maybe it will uh, just help to work in those one, two or three companies. That's, mm -hmm. that's my fear. Uh, I don't know if this... Uh, Makes sense, but we yeah. we began to see in the UK as well. Um, every university try to have their partners, and it quite directs the student to those company. And if mm. you don't study to the good university, let's say you have less chance. Yeah, and um, and uh, Rowan Miller is asking. Uh, I think as uh, as. Uh, question is very similar to this which is how does esports then fit within the overall gaming industry in terms of education right and he's asking uh, in the chat whether or not it's possible to broaden uh, that focus uh, Rowan do you, do you mean uh, broaden the focus between the fit between education and industry or to ensure that the education itself is more broad it might be that I missed the start, so I missed the context a little bit. But um, how does esports, I guess, in terms of curricular development, fit with um, within the bigger gaming industry and education of the bigger gaming industry? Is it is it a complement? Is it a substitute? Is it competing? Um, yeah, uh, thank you, Rowan, for your question. Uh, I, I will try to answer, but uh, not to forget the question of. Uh, I don't know how to pronounce mood. Um, um, so uh, for your question, uh, Ruan, uh, I think uh, esports is still a specific part of the gaming uh, uh, industry. So I would say that uh, if in the future, like we have more esports curriculum rather than curriculum in gaming, that might be a mistake because uh, at the end, if the esports industry is smaller than the gaming industry, because it's just a competitive aspect of the gaming industry, uh, it make maybe less sense to um, have more esports curriculum rather than gaming curriculum. Uh, so I guess that's maybe the reason why some uh, um, university um, try to develop gaming curriculum and inside those gaming curriculum they have an esports specific part uh, i saw this in france uh, again uh, that's the model of uh, gaming campus um but yeah how does esports fit with the overall gaming industry in terms of education um and and i, I would say about this uh, esports is quite transdisciplinary uh, topic like um, 
there is so many different jobs that you can um, learn um, without without following any sports curriculum. Um, like if you want to work in esports event management, you can do an event management degree and still uh, be able to work in esports. Like if I don't know, you you focus your master thesis on esports event management, it can still really make sense. And I think the same apply if you follow uh, um, many other type of curriculums that are not esports label. But uh, let's say uh, marketing curriculum as well, or many, many other in business. And it's hard to name all of them, but I, I think it's still possible. Um, and I, I, I got, I don't think that I put these quotes in the presentation, but I, I got some uh, interesting quotes. Um, one sports manager also in Vietnam uh, told me um, that. At the moment, he would still prefer to hire some uh, uh, employees that uh, uh, did some um, curriculum uh, outside esports because they will have some specific specific skills for the jobs that he try to to have. Um, like he was saying, for uh, there was a clear lack of uh, esports nutrition for their player, for instance. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know if my answer is really answers the question. I think it's good. Uh, we have time. We just have a couple of minutes left, and I see uh -huh. that uh, we have a student, uh, Muhammad Asri, who's here, and he's asked a question. Asri, do you have a do you have a mic? You want to ask directly? Uh, yeah. Uh, can you guys hear me? Sure. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, my question is, um, what do you think the uh, difference is with a standardized esports curriculum that can provide a student that an esports club would not be able to provide as sufficiently enough? So yeah, that's basically my question. So I don't know what the difference do you think there is, like, uh, with a standardized curriculum and an esports club where uh students can like. Uh, for example, make their own events or like ah uh, like they can have like practical, uh, experience in planning events, things like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so thank you very much for for your question. Is is it a uh, mood? I think. Uh, um, yes. I, call me Astrid. It's fine. Thank you. Uh, Astrid. Uh, sorry, Astrid. Um. So for for your question, uh, Astrid, uh, I think it's quite connected with. Uh, uh, what, uh, for instance, Pearson Education is trying to do globally. So with uh, the BTEC uh, in eSports at uh, high school, it's quite standard, standardized. Um, but I think uh, the main issue with uh, standardized eSports curriculum is that uh, uh, if you implement the same uh, standardized eSports curriculum in every country, you don't really take into consideration the local context. Like I saw just yesterday, they, they will try to develop some curriculum in, um, 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 oh, I, in English, like Emira Arab Uni, uh, UAE, um, in uh, also Saudi Arabia, I saw this. Um, but, but I think you cannot really just do a standardized curriculum everywhere in the world. Um, because for, for instance, like in France, we play really less mobile esports, whereas in, uh, in Vietnam or in Thailand, like you can go to the metro and see people playing uh, uh, mobile, uh, mobile game, for instance. Um, so I, I think we need to take into consideration the context. Also, also about the context in some country, the, the power about the government uh, can be quite important. Uh, I think in, in the case of Vietnam, it can be also quite uh, uh, important where some university like Vietnam National University, Hanoi and Ho Chi Minh, they have a direct special uh, um, position, I would say, 
um, towards the government. Uh, they have some more direct links that other university. Um, so yeah, I, I would say that um, standardized uh, for me is um, maybe not the, the point to start with in Vietnam, but but again maybe maybe other people will think the opposite. I know we meet with a person education in Vietnam in Hanoi, and it's actually what they want to do. So I think it can totally happen in one, two, three, four years. I don't know, but it it can totally happen. Um, but I would say maybe uh, if we have some uh, some minors, esports minor that can be connected with the esports club in university, maybe maybe it can be um, a bit more relevant. But uh, again. I, so I, I hope it answer your question. Yeah, uh, yeah, I think I understood the standardized part very well. Thank you. Okay. okay. Well, um, thank you very much. We've had a solid hour and I know some people need to go. We've had a couple of people need to drop out uh, here in the Asian time zone for their next meetings or whatever. There is the one um so there is one uh, aspect I, I didn't mention but i really maybe want to have some feedback like uh, this research i'm quite hesitating on uh, which um journal to choose uh, between two different journals um so the, the first one is a sport education and society which is a q1 uh, but they don't have any Esports uh, paper yet, mm. um, and the second second one is a Q3 uh, sports management education journal. But um, last year they published two um, articles uh, focusing on esports education and esports curriculum. And since I'm trying to find a job, <laughs> because uh, when I say I'm guest lecturer, I'm not paid, so I'm yeah, yeah. still unemployed since two years. So for me, it's quite important to try to find funding. Well, um, the answer the answer is easy. Always go for the higher ranked journal. But it, even okay. in that case, you you just send an email to the to the editor sometimes. Oh yeah. Um, any, anyways, I think you we can have this conversation uh, uh, later. Some people need oh, yeah, to go. No we're we're no starting problem, to have no yeah, we're starting to have a few people need to drop out due to time. Oh, yeah. I, I would like to thank everyone for coming today. Uh, feel free to um, connect with Florian directly or with me if you need to find how to get in touch with him. Uh, a wonderful presentation. Really good uh, questions and discussion afterwards. So thanks a lot, Florian, for joining. Thanks, everyone else. Um, we're going to take the summer off from this webinar series, but uh, we'll be back in um, probably August, uh, probably September, perhaps August with the next installation. And we will be in touch with that soon. Thank you, everyone. And have a nice Thank evening or, or a nice Thank day. Thank Bye. you very much. Have a, have a nice day or evening.